It's uh, my pleasure to, to welcome you all to this evening's uh, Kensei Lecture. I believe this is the 19th uh, lecture in our series presented by Kensei Foundation. Uh, I'm Trent Walker. I'm a member of the Kensei Foundation Academic Development Committee. I'm also a postdoc at the Ho Center for Buddhist Studies at Stanford University. Today's talk, as all of you know, uh, will be by Dr. Gareth Sparham, who's currently affiliated with the 84,000 Project. He will be speaking about a brief history of an introduction to the Shatta Saha Sriga Pragnya Paramita, or the perfection of wisdom in 100,000 lines. I'll say a little bit more about our speaker in a moment. As most of you know, uh, the Goodman Lectures are a, a monthly online series that are designed to build bridges between academic and general audiences interested in Buddhist studies. And this talk, like all of the past talks of the series, are recorded and they uh, are freely available online from Kensei Foundation's website and social media channels. The talks in this series are inspired by longtime Kensei Foundation friend and advisor, Professor Stephen D. Goodman, who passed away in 2020. Our series aims to reflect Stephen's enduring vision of making academic talks in Buddhist studies, uh, particularly those connected to the Foundation, freely available to all. Kensei Foundation, uh, established by Tsongsar Kensei Rinpoche, uh, has been supporting Buddhist study and practice since 2001 through grants, scholarships, and other kinds of collaborations. And if you're curious to learn more, I encourage you to visit www.kenseifoundation.org. Today, we are extraordinarily fortunate uh, that we get to hear a talk from Dr. Gareth Sparham. He earned his uh, PhD in 1970. Uh, on sorry, not in 1970, in 1989, uh, from the uh, University of British Columbia uh, with a fantastic uh, study of Haribhadra's Apisamaya uh, uh, Lankara Loka Pragna Paramita Vyakya, which is one of the a number of very important commentaries on the perfection of wisdom literature. And uh, Dr. Sparham is one of the foremost specialists in this literature uh, in the world, and he has translated numerous texts uh, from Tibetan. He's also a, a fantastic uh, specialist in the, the Sanskrit dimensions of this tradition as well. Um, but throughout his uh, 20 years, or I think more than 20 years of being ordained as a Tibetan monastic and now continuing to work um, after that uh, time as a, as a translator, also as a teacher of Tibetan, teaching for many years at the University of Michigan, uh, later at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, at present, he is the lead translator for a project of 84,000 to translate the uh, this perfection of wisdom in 100,000 lines, this extraordinarily important text, perhaps one of the longest Buddhist texts of all time, and a key linchpin in the perfection of wisdom literature. And we'll be learning a lot more about uh, this text, uh, where it comes from, what it means within the scope of Buddhist teachings and literature from Dr. Sparham today. So I hope uh, you'll join me in, in welcoming him. We'll have a chance, as always, ways to, for your questions uh, after his talk. So if you have any uh, questions that come up, please submit those to KF uh, Q&A via the chat feature. So you can open, open the chat feature and when you select down different people who you can chat to, you'll see two um, options. One is KF uh, uh, Q and A, and that's where you'll submit any questions that you would like to ask Dr. Sparham. And then, if you have any technical issues, any technical uh, problems with Zoom, you can submit a, a question to KF uh, Tech Support, and we'd be delighted to, to offer any support on that. And if you're having trouble hearing or, or seeing uh, the lecture, um, so uh, without uh, further ado. I would like to to welcome uh, Dr. Sparham to to give this lecture. Thank you so much for being with us here uh, uh, this evening in California time, and we really look forward to your talk. Thank you. Well, Trent, uh, thank you so much for that introduction. And um, to all of you out there uh, in the different places, in the different times, uh, thank you. 
for being here and uh, my greetings to you all. So I would like uh, first to thank the Kenzie Foundation. It has supported my work translating the perfection of wisdom scriptures for many years. In particular, on this occasion, I would like to thank the foundation for inviting me to give the 19th in the series of Goodman Lectures. Not long before Steve Goodman died, just before COVID interrupted our lives. He asked me to give a lecture to his class at the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco. The topic he asked me to lecture on was the perfection of wisdom. So for me, it's, it's, it's a special occasion. So today to begin my talk, I have uh, two epigraphs. Let's see if I can get them here. So uh, the first is from uh, long in the past, from the Sutta Nipata, when abiding in their own views, thinking it is the highest, a person esteems it as the best in the world. They say all others are inferior to this. Therefore, they have not passed beyond disputes. And a second from a modern person, this is from Max Born, the winner of the 1954 Nobel Prize in Physics for his, quote, fundamental research in quantum mechanics. He writes, the belief in a single truth and in being the possessor thereof is the root cause of all evil in the world. So uh, having in mind uh, that if there's one thing said, uh, the lecture will be a decent lecture. I, um, I, I say that in this lecture, I'm going to try to suggest that the 100,000, the Shatta Sahasrika, is a scripture that repeats the earliest known teaching of Shakyamuni that urges practitioners to avoid the violence that comes from competing views. And here, a view one can understand in the sense of a culture or a, a tradition or anything which is of fundamental importance to one. So first, I want to look a little bit at the history. So again, let me um, just give you a little... view of what we're looking at. So the 100,000, the, sh the uh, Shata Sahasrika is the Sanskrit word for 100,000, Shata for short. Perfection of wisdom is a colossal scripture, one of the longest sacred books in existence. 12 volumes running for nearly uh, 10,000 pages in the Tibetan translation included in the Kangyur. The 100,000 has been translated into Chinese, Tibetan, and Mongolian. A Chinese version of the 100,000 is included in Xuanzang's Big Prajnaparamita Sutra, parts of which have been translated into English. The translation into Tibetan is associated with the famous translator, Yeshi Dei, who lived from 730 to 805. That's of the Common Era. Pages and parts of rolls found in the Dunhuang caves show that Yeshi Dei's translation into Tibetan was already circulating widely in the early years of the ninth century. The 84,000 has commissioned a production of the first full translation of the Tibetan version into English. My reflections on the 100,000 presented in this lecture are based on the work I have been doing translating this scripture over the last months. Edward Collins, here's a, um, this uh, picture is of the Tibetan um, translation of the 100,000, just one page from the huge uh, book. And here is, it's not a very good picture, but a picture of a, um, from a Sanskrit manuscript of the same work. So Edward Collins, a Western scholar of the perfection of wisdom literature, gives the following description of the 100,000 
in his survey of the Prajnaparamita literature. He characterizes it as, quote, a huge unwieldy text invested with high prestige, but very hard to follow, with a huge load of repetitions, a combination of a number of disjointed treatises composed at different times, which reflected the interests of succeeding generations of Buddhists. Close quote. About the repetitions, he said, again quoting, a great deal of Buddhist meditation is a kind of repetitive drill which applies certain laws or principles to a certain number of fixed categories. If, for example, you take the statement that X is emptiness and the very emptiness is X, then the version in 100,000 lines laboriously applies this principle to about 200 items, beginning with form and ending with the dharmas or attributes, which are characteristic of a Buddha. Close quote. Edward Collins' character, uh, characterization of the um, 100,000 should not be taken as a denigration. He was no fool, and he recognized its importance, especially when spoken or chanted. The length and repetition, as I shall show below, has its own power and makes many subtle and complex points of doctrine clear. So, I'm speaking here in the beginning of this lecture from what um, Stefan uh, Zacchetti called the Western Buddhological academic point of view. And um, I, I'm trying to put across the, the notion of different views, the value of those views, uh, at the same time, how they shouldn't ever become a, a basis for, um, certainly for violence. So um, then there's the notion of a core section of the sutra. And here I've got a, a little bit of a, um, a diagram, which I hope sort of makes a little bit clearer what I'm trying to get across at this point. So in forming the description of the 100,000 by Edward Collins, is the belief that there is an early core section of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra, its original heart, as it were. According to Collins, who translated many of the important Perfection of Wisdom Sutra scriptures into English, this core is to be found in the first Subhuti chapter of the 8,000, that's the Ashta Sahasrika, that has come down to us today. Heuristically, this explanation is very helpful. In the 100,000, for example, it is possible to see how the relatively short Subhuti chapter of the 8,000 has been expanded into nearly four complete volumes, more than 2,000 pages that comprise its, thir its first 13 chapters. In more recent years, Edward Collins died in 1979, Research into the, perfection, into the perfection of wisdom has focused on the earliest translations of the perfection of wisdom scriptures into Chinese, and more recently on fragments of scriptures discovered in Gantara, a region in the northwestern part of the Indian subcontinent. The earliest translations into Chinese, dated to the second century of the Common Era, is a translation by Lokakshama of an early version of the 8,000. Lokakshama's translation does not have the name 8,000, however. The naming of perfection of wisdom scriptures by their length did not happen until some four or 500 uh, years later. So um, uh, I'm sort of at this point talking about the core of the 8,000, which is this theoretical scripture, which uh, Edward Conzer first um, uh, suggests uh, is in existence. So um, again, the naming of the perfection of wisdom scriptures by their length did not happen until some four or five hundred uh, later. Um, Lokakshama's translation has the title Way of Practice. Harry Falk and Seishi Karashima compared Lokakshama's translation with fragments of an early version of a perfection of wisdom scripture in Gan. Gandhari, an Indian vernacular spoken in Gandhara, 
written in Karoshti letters. Karashima, in this and his other works, showed before his recent and timely death that this vernacular, not classical Sanskrit, lies behind the Chinese transliterations and indeed the meanings of some of the core Buddhist terms in Lokakshima's translation. Karama, uh, Karashima's is a tremendous work. Still, it is not certain that the fragments Falk and Karashima worked on are exemplars of an early version of a core 8000 rather than a part of a longer version of the scripture that developed it to the 100,000. So here you'll see uh, we have, these are in a sense theoretical um, works, a core of the 8,000, the Ashtasashika, and then a core of the 100,000, which we're going to call following Zaketi, the long version of the sutra. So about the long version of the sutra, So the 100,000 is the longest extant version of a perfection of wisdom scripture. But the long version of the sutra or long sutra following the work of the late esteemed Stefan Sacchetti is a theoretical scripture like the core scripture of the 8,000 that develops slightly later than, but in many ways parallel to a core version of the scripture that later expands into the 8,000. This long version of the sutra is a template, as it were, not only for the 100,000, but also for the other long versions. That's the Panchas, the uh, Panchasahashrika, the 25,000, and the Ashtadasha Sahashrika, the 18,000, and so on. This perhaps explains um, why Xuanzang put all three together into his big Prajnaparamita Sutra, a colossal work that would indeed be the longest sacred book in existence if it is taken as a single scripture. So up to this point then, I have um, been given the Western Buddhological academic um, suggestions about the history of this text that we're talking about. And here, um, this is the earliest version, look, Akshima's translation here in about 150 of the common era or so. Then the longest versions of the, of the scripture, the Pancha Vinsha, the, the, the Pancha Vunshati Sahashrika and so on. And then the actual scriptures that we have today coming about say 650 these dates are, are not exact but they're, they're approximate and at this point we do have the 100,000 and we do have the 8,000 in the form that we have them today in the in the Kangyu and in many other um, uh, versions so now I want to present a, a different view. And this is what I'm going to call the Mahayana Buddhist view. So uh, up to this point, this history of the 100,000 that I have presented is from the perspective of a Western Buddhological academic tradition. It is not the only tradition. According to the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, the 100,000 and other perfection of wisdom scriptures go back as finished books at least 2,500 years to the time of the Buddha Shakyamuni, and are perhaps even an Adikalika from a beginningless time. The Mahayana Buddhist tradition, based on the Samdhi Nimochana Sutra, says Shakyamuni, during his lifetime, turned the wheel of the Dharma three times. When he turned the wheel the first time near Varanasi, he taught the foundational scriptures. The, explanation of the Four Noble Truths and so on. And then when he turned it a second time near Rajbraha, he taught all the perfection of wisdom uh, scriptures. That's the 100,000, the 8,000, all of them. Thus, according to this tradition, all the scriptures as we find them today were taught during Shakyamuni's lifetime. 
In many Tibetan Chunjungs, histories of the doctrine, it says that not long after Nagarjuna's Nirvana, when the perfection of wisdom scriptures were no longer highly valued by the early community, oh, excuse me, I'll just get you another. I rather like this picture, I must admit. Where are we here? So, um, when they were no longer highly valued by the early community, the Nagas, I like to think of them as antique dealers, took them, the scriptures, the perfection of wisdom scriptures, deep into the oceans, where they kept them, we are told, on the crowns of their heads, like the mythic jewel that is the prized possession of a cobra. Nagarjuna then restored the perfection of wisdom scriptures originally taught by Shakyamuni on Vulture's Peak near Rajgraha to the ordinary human world. It appears he brought them back at approximately the same time as the perfection of wisdom scriptures were being written down in Gandhara on birch bark about 2,000 years ago, or some 500 years after Shakyamuni's Nirvana. And so here you see the Naga bringing the scriptures out of the ocean uh, another rather um uh, a way i'm used to hearing it is that it's not so much that um the nagas come up out but he goes way down i rather like the idea of him going all the way down there um so um so we have compu uh, competing views or traditions Still, it is evident that the traditional Mahayana Buddhist history of the 100,000 is not uninformed by the importance of the need to construct a history that unfolds chronologically any more than the Western Buddhological academic tradition is uninformed by the need to explain the relationship of the foundational Buddhist scriptures Again, by foundation, I'm talking about the scriptures which teach things like the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Noble Path, and so forth, or the, um, uh, the Noble Eightfold Path, and so forth. So the relationship of the foundational Buddhist scriptures to the perfection of wisdom scriptures. So um, I, I, I'm trying to balance traditions in this way. I am. Um, I, I'm drawing on a, uh, it's an actual a friend of mine, he's a very elderly person now, uh, been very, very good to me. He's a, um, a, a developmental psychologist and philosopher, Juan Pascual Leone. So, uh, and uh, as you can see here in the, um, in the slide, I'm going to try to talk using his words from a constructivist middle position. So, in a recent publication, the developmental psychologist and philosopher Juan Pascual Leone contrasts a, quote, empiricist epistemology that interprets knowledge mostly as modeled by constraints of outer reality, close quote. He, he contrasts that empiricist epistemology with a rationalist epistemology that considers knowledge as a product of the working mind. By empiricist, understand data-driven, and by rationalist, understand based on a theory. He argues that a constructivist middle position, that's his term, that balances the two, is the correct perspective from which to describe the mental development of a human being from the earliest stages of infancy up until adulthood. Borrowing from him, we might say that the Western Buddha logical academic tradition privileges an, an empiricist epistemology, searching backwards chronologically based on empirical, optimally material evidence to construct a history of the 100,000, while the Mahayana Buddhist tradition privileges a rationalist epistemology that constructs the history of the 100,000 based on theoretical arguments. The constructivist middle position 
does not treat the Western Buddha logical academic tradition and the Mahayana Buddhist traditions as extremes, but rather attempts to balance them properly to arrive at a fuller explanation of the history. So that's my um, uh, attempt at a um, giving a history of this uh, 100,000 that we're talking about here today. And now uh, I want to um, talk about what it means when, you, when you're talking about the words of the Buddha, because of course the, the um, 100,000 is um, accepted by certainly the Mahayana Buddhist tradition as being the words of the Buddha. So at this point, I um, pivot, if you will, to talk about the words of the Buddha. So first, the non-Mahayana compilation of the words of the Buddha 2,000 years ago. And here I'll just go back to my earlier slide. And we're talking now here about the Udanavarga, which is not a Mahayana scripture. It's a non-Mahayana scripture, which is a compilation of the words of the Buddha. So I want to talk about that for a moment. So in the 1970s, a few years after I became a monk, at the suggestion of my late friend and guru, Lhosan Gyatso, I translated a collection. I'll just get my dear old friend. There we are. I collected, I translated a collection of foundational Buddhist statements called the Udhanavarga, a compilation of statements made for a purpose, gathered, gathered by Dharmatrata some 400 years or so after the statements. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I have uh, jumped a little bit here. I, I first um, want to, let me just go back here. I'm, I'm sorry, I absolutely, let's go back here. I jumped ahead a little bit, so I have to just go back. Yes. So um, before we get to the Udhanavarga, I want to uh, just present what uh, has been suggested as the earliest known words of the Buddha. So, um, uh, so I'm talking now, again, to go back to my earlier slide here. I'm talking now about here. 500 uh, before the common era, the actual words of Shakyamuni. These um, are suggested as probably as close as you can get to the actual words of the um, Buddha, of Shakyamuni. So already nearly 50 years ago, the late Luis Gomez, whom I was fortunate to know during my years at the University of Michigan, pointed out that sections of the Atakavaka, the chapter of eight section of the Sutta Napata, the group of discourses, that's the source of the epigraph with which I began this lecture, anticipated or even advanced the Mahayana doctrine of emptiness taught by Nagarjuna. This is the Nagarjuna who is said to have reintroduced the perfection of wisdom scriptures to our human world. The Chula Viyuha Sutta, short discourse on disposition sections of the uh, section of the Atakavaga says, what some say is true, others say is empty, false. Thus contending, they dispute. Why do those following a secluded religious life not say one and the same thing? On account of what he considers his opponent to be a fool, he calls himself an expert. Calling himself an expert, he de despises the other. And yet he speaks in that very same way. Just again, I have that citation on the slide here. Yes, it really is a, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's an absolutely beautiful. Uh, statement. So the Pali Canon from which this citation is taken is not, of course, 
a particularly old collection of the Buddha's words. But this passage and other similar passages have been judged by earlier scholars like Heinrich Luders on linguistic grounds to be the oldest parts of the Pali Canon because they show traces of Ardha Magadhi, a language postulated as the vernacular in use in Magadha at the time of the historical Buddha. There appear to have been meaningless animosities and perhaps even violent encounters between followers of different Brahmanical Jaina, Arjivaka, and emerging Buddhist groups. This problem seems to be a feature of all things to do with religion and scripture. Leaving aside other traditions, even today, be it among Western academics, among new Western Buddhist believers, or among traditional believers, the more important the teacher or practice or scripture is taken to be, the more it generates conflict. So now um, uh, um, I, I want to go back to that place where I accidentally jumped ahead and talk. I can go back to this one. I'm now talking about this Uttanavarga, which is a non Mahayana scripture, which understands itself the which understand itself to be presenting a collection of the words of the Buddha, a non-Mahayana collection of the words of the Buddha. This earlier um, citation I just gave on linguistic grounds might be said to be the earliest words of the Buddha. Now I'm talking about um, here, about, about 2,000 years ago, a non-Mahayana collection. And again, this is how I came to know it. As I was saying, in the 1970s, a few years after I became a monk at the suggestion of my late friend and guru Lok San Gyatso, I translated a collection of foundational Buddhist statements called the Udhanavarga, gathered by Dharmatrata some 400 years or so after the statements recorded in the Chula Vyuha Sutta were first made. Lok San Gyatso was the director of the Riklam Roktra, the Institute of Buddhist Dialectics in Dharamshala from his opening in the 1970s until his murder in 1997. Among his first students was a young monk who was epileptic and on account of his recurrent seizures, after a year or so of being unable to continue with his studies, Lobsang Gyatso had the young monk focus on calligraphy. And when he became quite proficient, had him make a copy of the Udhanavarga in the Tibetan translation included in the Kangyur. In those days, not long after the Tibetans had come into exile, books were very hard to come by. There was a block print copy of the entire Kangyur kept next to the Institute of the uh, kept next to the Institute in the Dalai Lama's temple. So Lobsang Gyatso borrowed the volume that included the Udhanavarga and had the monk with epilepsy make a copy that Lops and Gyatso then had reproduced by lithograph technology. It was this Tibetan edition that he gave to me and suggested I translate into English. The sick monk, the sick monk left the institute long, long after and went back to live with his father who was a cook and was able to live a successful life as a calligrapher known for making excellent copies of texts which were then published and circulated in the exile community. So I have puzzled I've puzzled over the Udhanavarga for many years. On the one hand, it is an important scripture in the Western Buddhological academic tradition, <clears throat> because that tradition, for reasons that go beyond the scope of this lecture, has long engaged in a search for the oldest and most authentic words of the Buddha. On the other hand, in its Tibetan translation, it is included in the collection of the Buddha's word, in which Mahayana and Tantric scriptures are given equal status <clears throat> as Buddha Vachana, authentic words of the Buddha. It is known and used by Tibetan Buddhists like Lopsan Gyatso, um, with a, um, like Lopsan Gyatso, whose Buddhist practice was suffused not only with a belief in the Mahayana scriptures, but with a belief in the Buddhist tantras as well. The Udhanavarga, furthermore, is, a is in a type of Sanskrit associated with the language of the Mahayana scriptures, 
that was compiled by a follower of a Salvasti Vata school living in the northwest part of the Indian subcontinent at about the same time as the appearance of the oldest known Mahayana scriptures some 2,000 years ago. All of this does not, of course, make the Udana Varga a Mahayana scripture or a perfection of wisdom scripture. Dharmatrata Sarvastivada school did not accept that the Vaipulya scriptures, the name given to early Mahayana scriptures, were Buddha Vachana, words of the Buddha. Furthermore, the foundational Buddhist statements in Sanskrit that he compiled in his Udana Varga are found, though in a different order, in similar compilations in the Dhammapada and Sutta Nipata written in Pali, a language not associated with the Mahayana. In the Udana Varga we read, just as, tributary, just as tributaries gone into the Ganga flow down and merge into the sea, the path taught by the one with vast wisdom is entered to attain the state of immortality. I bow to you who out of compassion for all beings turned the wheel of the doctrine not heard until now, the protector, teacher of gods and humans who has gone beyond suffering existence. Such lines in the Udana Varga show that the compiler Dharmatrata was engaged in the reproduction of the dharma that was the object of his serene confidence and his compilation of the Udana Varga was for him a performative act of faith. One reading of the title Udana Varga itself suggests this, a compilation that causes a spontaneous outburst of admiration just on hearing the statements. So. There then is an example of a, a, a later words of the Buddha, which are non-Mahayana, uh, coming about this time. We don't have these two earlier um, theoretical compilations or these two uh, core of the perfection of wisdom, but we do have the um, actual perfection of wisdom scriptures coming into being not long after, about the same time as the Udana Varga. <clears throat> so now I want to therefore talk about Mahayana compilations of the words of the Buddha. So the perfection of wisdom, I argue, is also a reproduction of the words of the Buddha. The reproduction of them differs in form, but not in content. So, here we have um, a part of the Mahayana perfection of wisdom scripture. So the perfection of wisdom is also a reproduction of the words of the Buddha. The reproduction of them differs in form, but not in content. In the Heart Sutra, this is the citation here, Sharadwati um, uh, son Shariputra, a disciple of the historical Buddha. So Shariputra is a disciple of the historical Buddha. Um, and he's the one who's speaking. Historically, he would have been someone who practiced the practices conveyed in the foundational Buddhist scriptures. He asked Avalokiteshvara how to train in the perfection of wisdom. In the 100,000, um, and I'm going to come back to this citation later, so, um, um, so keep it in mind, but I will be coming back to it later. In the 100,000, the question is, is put like this. How should a bodhisattva, a great being, who wants to fully awaken to all phenomena in all their aspects, persevere in the perfection of wisdom. Katam bodhisattvena mahasattvena sarvakaran sarvadharma abhisam bodhukamena pranyaparamitayam yoga karaniya. So the bodhisattva Shariputra is asking about here is the historical Buddha when he was called Bodhisattva before his enlightenment. 
And Shariputra is asking about the practice of somebody who practices like he, Shakyamuni, practiced. Implicit in his question, of course, are all beings who have the potential to be bodhisattvas and reach enlightenment? The response to Shariputra's question in the recent translation of the Heart Sutra published by the 84,000 is, Shariputra, sons of a noble family or daughters of a noble family, who wish to engage in the practice of the profound perfection of wisdom, should see things in this way. They should correctly observe the five aggregates to be empty of an intrinsic nature. and so on. So I'm going to come back to these two statements later. In the 100,000, not only every aggregate, skanda, but each of the 12 ayatanas, the 18 dhatus, the 12 links of dependent origination, each part of the path and each different attainment is separately one by one connected with the absence of its own inherent existence and so on. When reading, or in my case, slowly translating each word of the 100,000, the repetition of the words of the foundational scriptures of Buddhism systematized in the Lakshana Shastras, the Abhidharma, is striking. The Abhidharma is the third of the three baskets, the Tripitaka, into which the words of the Buddha are said to be collected. The objects to be known systematizes the four truths for noble beings, the praxis, systematizes the eightfold noble path, the ultimate reality of things, systematizes the emptiness, signlessness, and wishlessness gateways to liberation, and the attainment systematizes the eight goals of stream enter and so on, and the realization and attainments of Buddha Shakyamuni constitute most of the scripture. The, the point is, when you have something like the Heart Sutra, you just have aggregates. You don't see how fundamental the actual foundational scriptures, the words of the Buddha, as we know them from the foundational scriptures, are. Um, like the statements in the Udharnavarga, that are a repetition of the foundational Buddhist teachings received by Dharmatrata. The repetitions of the foundational Buddhist category systematized in the Lakshana Shastras, the Abhidharma, <clears throat> in the perfection of wisdom scriptures, are a repetition of foundational Buddhist teachings. This, is, this explains in part why the perfection of wisdom scriptures announce themselves to be like Dharmatrata's compilation, the words of the Buddha. So what about Mahayana and non-Mahayana words of the Buddha. And I'm thinking uh, it's a complex issue. Well, when do you get Mahayana? When is it not Mahayana? So some years ago, uh, Jan Natye, Dr. Jan Natye, a respected expert on the Mahayana scriptures, referenced an important statement tucked away in one of the many articles written by the late erudite Western scholar, uh, De Jong, where he wrote, that some of the oldest passages in the Mahayana scriptures may be among the latest to be incorporated into the scripture as it has been handed down to later generations. He had perceptively observed that the growth in the, in the size of Mahayana scriptures like the perfection of wisdom was through the incorporation of some of the very oldest Buddhist canonical statements. He was cautioning his reader against dating a text based on the date of a very old passage within it. Professor de Jong penned his insightful statements at a time when research into Mahayana scripture was still in its early stages. <clears throat> For him at that time, it seems, statements of the sort compiled in the Udhanavarga could be found inserted into a Mahayana scripture, but they could not by themselves be Mahayana statements. Yet the earlier and earlier one traces back the development of a Mahayana scripture, the more and more the statements in it begin to resemble the foundational statements. And the foundational statements, uh, statements themselves and the statements in the mature Mahayana scriptures are so intimately intertwined 
that you cannot separate them from each other and still have a Mahayana scripture. In 1955, when the search by Western scholars for the authentic words of the Buddha was still in full swing, the technique of searching backwards through time led André Barreau, as translated by Lorraine Delano, whose work I will be returning to below, it led him to ask, this is Delano's translation from the French, quote, are there sects of the lower vehicle ontological theses showing Mahayana tendencies? To this question, we can give an affirmative answer with all certitude. The sects in question all belong to the Mahasangika group. The famous French scholar held that the views of the Mahayana are discovered in seed form in earlier non-Mahayana groups. This seems wrong-headed to me. The earliest development of the Mahayana more likely occurs where there is a reaffirmation of the foundational scriptures. And that reaffirmation again leads to further developments. This is because the earlier tradition, be it among the Sarvastivadins, in a, Mahas, in a Mahasangika Nikaya, or in one of the groups championing, uh, championing proto-Mahayana scriptures, understands itself as receiving and fostering the earlier authentic Buddhist tradition. When a number of competing groups have come into being over the passage of time, there is a divergence in opinions among the groups who understand themselves as having received an authentic earlier tradition. The perfection of wisdom scriptures claimed to be Buddha Vachana, the words of the Buddha, has been interpreted as just a strategy to give them legitimacy accorded to, to give them the legitimacy according to the foundational scriptures. That may or may not be the case. What is certain from a close reading of the 100,000 is that the foundational Buddhist scriptures and the practices as they have come down, systematized in the Lakshana Shastras, the Abhidharma, are essential in them, as are the foundational statements in the Udana Varga. Just as the Udana Varga is not quite a reproduction of older foundational statements and not quite a commentary on established scripture either, this is probably why the editors of the Tibetan canon place the translation not just in the Tibetan Kangya, the collection of words of the Buddha, but in the Tengya, the collection of commentaries as well. So too with the perfection of wisdom scriptures. The repetitions are not just a performative act of faith. They are imbued with the sentiment in the earliest known words of the Buddha that exhorted followers that exhort followers to avoid the negative states of mind that arise among groups competing for patronage and prominence. So um, now I, I want to, in the time that's left, go over to a, um, an explanation of, uh, of this in, of, of this, um, uh, an explanation of the perfection of wisdom sutras uh, in the Abhisamaya Alankara. And it shows the importance of compassion. And compassion is a very problematic word in English because it's it somehow, somehow the, um, in Sanskrit, what's called an upaya, a, a, how it's functioning as, as an upaya, especially epistemologically, um, tends to be lost. So uh, up to this point, I have tried to show that foundational Buddhist scriptures and proto-Mahayana scriptures share many features in common and that foundational Buddhist scriptures remain at the heart of the longer and shorter versions of the perfection of wisdom that emerge over the centuries. In the time remaining, I want to look at the role of karuna, compassion, or more exactly, bodhicitta the production of the thought of enlightenment, setting the mind on enlightenment, the aspiration for enlightenment, and so on. 
Uh, this is um, bodhicitta or bodhicitta pata, and I want to show the role that it plays in the perfection of wisdom, how it is connected with the centrality of the foundational scriptures. So in the 100,000 as cited above, and this I've got the same citation that, I, uh, that, that we looked at earlier. In the 100,000 as cited above, Shariputra asked, how should a bodhisattva, a great being who wants to awaken fully to all phenomena in all their aspects, persevere in the perfection of wisdom? Now, what pops out here, uh, one, full awakening, that's the abhisambodhu, abhisambodhi, and then the perfection of wisdom, the prajnaparamita. The reference, the, 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 the question of Shariputra doesn't obviously reference karuna, compassion. But in response to Shariputra's question in the 100,000, the Buddha called Bhagavan, blessed Lord, not explicitly Avalokiteshvara, the Buddha of compassion is in the Heart Sutra, explains at length that bodhisattvas quote, should stay in the perfection of wisdom without there being any place to stay. Pranya paramitayam stitva asthana yogena. This is the Heart Sutra's collect, uh, correct, uh, sorry, correctly observing everything is empty of an intrinsic nature. Now, in the 100,000, then, over 60 folio sides, just, you know, in the Heart Sutra, it's one line, basically. It's 60 folio sides. It's an incredible uh, amount, right? It really is quite staggering when you're translating or, or reading it. Over 60 folio sides using the word desire or something very similar to each to that each time. And this is really the important point. It's this word karma which we'll come back to in just a moment, karma, which is here, wants. Um, this word want, karma, it continually says what anything you could possibly think of, a bodhisattva wanting that should practice the perfection of wisdom, should engage in the perfection of wisdom. And it comes again and again and again Again and again and again with absolutely any part of the foundational scripture, anything to do with practice, all of it. So then over 60 folio sides, using the word desire each time in the 100,000, it lists the topics taught in the foundational Buddhist scriptures, going through them one by one, including all the meditational attainments, ending with the desire that, quote, just from hearing my name, Multitudes of beings in world systems, numerous as the grains of sand of the river Ganga, will become settled in unsurpassed, perfectly complete enlightenment. The desire, karma, just because of the repetition in the scripture, emerges as the source that drives a bodhisattva to comprehend or abandon or realize or develop any of the listed phenomena to some Krishna and Yavadana dharmas that constitute the perfection of wisdom. It is an origin of all that is a benefit to beings. The, 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 the karma, which as we'll see in a moment, is, is usually a bad word. It now is. Uh, so the desire is intimately connected with its objects and aims in the Scripture, and in that sense, is the perfection of wisdom. It is always to be approached an upalamba yogena by way of not apprehending anything. This is another way of saying, as in the Heart Sutra, collect, uh, correctly observing to be empty of an intrinsic nature. So now I want to, if I might just go straight on here, to look at how. Certainly in the Tibetan tradition as I know it, and I think one can argue that perhaps the, the most important explanation of the perfection of wisdom's scriptures. This um, is the explanation of these lines in the 
Abhisamaya Alankara. So the opening section, this is compassion, as explained in the Abhisamaya Alankara, the opening section of the 100,000 does not explicitly use the word compassion, it uses the word karma. The author of an important Indian explanation of the perfection of wisdom, the Abhisamaya Alankara, the ornament for the clear realizations, Jetsun Jamgun, and here we have him, um, Jetsun Jamgun, um, Maitreya, in the Tibetan commentarial tradition, uh, tradition, he's the author, explicitly connects this karma with compassion. <clears throat> So, uh, yeah, well, let me just give you this. So, this is what we're looking at here. This verse, verse from the Abhisamaya Alankara. So, in other words, this is the explanation of those sixty folios or it's argued of that one line in the heart sutra or many many other versions of it in the different um versions of the perfection of wisdom this is how um maitreya jatsun jangun is explaining it chitot pada parartaya samyak sambodhi karma he takes the word karma from the sutra now this is an absolutely foundational scripture in Tibetan. Um Semke Pani Shendunche Yanta Sope Changchuk De. And it means in English, Chitot Pada. Again, many translations, Khan said production of the thought or aspiration for enlightenment. Bodhicitta is the desire for perfect, complete awakening for the needs of others. He takes the word karma, want, wish, desire. He takes this word from the sutra and explicitly connects it with compassion. The desire for the needs of others. Maitreya, um, he takes the word karma and karma, don't forget, means want, wish, desire sensory gratification associated in popular culture, well, Western culture at least, through books like the Karma Sutra, as primarily with sexual pleasure, right from the scripture. It is rendered want and wish in English translations. Maitreya glosses it as conveying the intensity of the compassion that always accompanies the bodhicitta. He takes the word chitta, mind or thought or aspiration, as well as utpad, to cause to arise, to produce, and of course, Bodhi, enlightenment, from the opening section of the 100,000, or at least the long version of the sutra as well. Maitreya's signal contribution lies in putting together Chitopada, the production of the thought of enlightenment, as a technical term, linking it with the force of compassion as the origin. So how we're we doing for time. Mm. Yeah, so I'm going to just summarize then the uh, end of my paper because it's taking um, me a lot longer to read it than I had anticipated. So um, what I do in the uh, final part of my paper um, is I go to the homage of the... Um, the Abhisamaya Alankara, and go through it to show how, for Maitreya, the mother perfection of wisdom, and mother means perfection of wisdom here, here she is, this mother perfection of wisdom, the origin of all of the Buddhist scriptures, and really the fundamental Buddhist scripture that is being talked about is the foundational scriptures explaining the Four Noble Truths and so on. And I go from there 
having um, looked at that, um, explanation by Maitreya to deal with the problem of nihilism and how compassion balances that nihilism in the Buddhist scriptures, in the perfection of wisdom. Uh, and I end, um, and perhaps I'll read this, um, I end by dealing with what's called in the perfection of wisdom, the, how to say, the, 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 the work of Mara. And the work of Mara is actually these same scriptures, but when these same scriptures are being taken in a manner which causes them to become a, a source of conflict. And so, the undercutting of all of not just what the scripture says, and this is really the point I'm trying to make, but the actual scriptures themselves, be it the Mahayana scriptures, be it the non-Mahayana scriptures, be it the original words of the Buddha, whatever it is, those two are without any swabhava, without any anything that makes them inherently authentic. And that kind of nihilism then has to be balanced. It's balanced with compassion. And I end, and I'll just read this if I might. Let me conclude with a word about the relevance of the teaching in the 100,000, even for a modern reader today. Its presentation of sacred scripture has ramifications for the way a reader understands his or her own culture, intellectual heritage, ethnic or religious tradition, particular sect or whatever, the seemingly impossible balance between the truth and value of one's own uh, groups, sorry, the, the, the seemingly impossible balance between the truth and value of one's groups, of one group's own religious or cultural or ethnic identity, and the imperative of reconciling this with the diversity of groups, is presented in the 100,000 as, as it is interpreted in the Abhisamaya Alankara in terms of the competing truth claims of different Buddhist and perhaps even non-Buddhist scriptures. Its vision of scripture, culture, having a validity and value for those whose lives predispose them to embrace it as holy, of fundamental importance, and of a relativizing principle, the ultimate vanity of all human constructs, is at the heart of its message. The pressing questions we face today about the absoluteness or incommensurability of cultures or traditions are, if not solved by the quite transcendent, transcendent vision of how sacred scripture, uh, are, if not solved by the quite a uh, transcendent vision of how sacred scripture should be viewed as sacred in the Shatta Sahasra Pajna Paramita, at least addressed in a meaningful way. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sparham, for this really illuminating and far-reaching talk. Uh, quite astounding within the, the space of just these 50 or so minutes that we've had this chance to listen to you that you've made such a productive and interesting connections between the foundational uh, scriptures of, of Buddhism and the place of Mahayana texts like these uh, perfection of wisdom texts uh, within that, the kinds, uh, uh, this um, approach that you've um, modeled for us uh, based on uh, Juan Pascal, um, Leone, I think you mentioned as a kind of constructivist middle position, sort of taking these ideas from developmental psychology and uh, bringing them in to bring two different quite um, what we might normally think of as contradictory uh, perspectives on the the history of these perfection of wisdom texts together. Um, and then also, as you've moved toward the end of your talk, um, taking us right to the the heart of the matter of what this text is about and showing us that 
even in the vast length of this text, uh, including the portions that uh, you have um, or that others have seen as maybe this is just kind of a, a repetitions for the sake of performing faith in some way, but rather that in these very repetitions, in the kinds of very long passages that may draw on the earliest developments of, of, of Buddhist ideas, that we really see some of the most important ideas of the text. So I, I know that many of you have, have questions and would like to ask uh, questions to our speaker at this time. Mm -hmm. So um, if you do have a question, uh, please, uh, again, just use the, the chat uh, feature and submit a question to KF uh, Q&A, and then I'll be able to relay selected questions um, to, to Dr. Sparham. Um, while we're waiting for some questions to come in, I, I hope you don't mind if I ask some some questions of my own. I'd like to begin with a question that sort of just on a very basic level. Um, some people here looking in the in the audience have um, many decades of studying uh, Mahayana scriptures in academic and and Buddhist settings. Um, others, this may be a relatively new topic. I was wondering if you could shed some light on what you see as the connections uh, between the um, Apisam Apisamaya Lankara and uh, which you have translated along with, I think, three different commentaries in Sanskrit and Tibetan traditions of this uh, massive and very important uh, Pragyamparamita commentary attributed to Maitreya. What uh, relevance does that commentary have to your current translation work? How does it play a role in how you're translating the perfection of wisdom in 100,000 lines? Uh, well, I appreciate the question. It's a, uh, it definitely is a good question. Um, the Abhisamaya Alankara is, uh, it's a very odd little book. It's very short, very short, but uh, it's traditional in the um, tradition that I studied with to memorize it and chant it. And it's not a book that uh, even when you've memorized it and you're chanting it, that you really know what it's talking about. Um, and it takes a long time to understand why it would be as central and important as it is in the um, Tibetan reception of the perfection of wisdom literature. And it is unbelievably important in the reception of the 100,000, the 8,000, 8, the hearts, or to any of these many, many different sacred scriptures under the general rubric of perfection of wisdom. Now, as one reads the actual sutras or scriptures, you do realize that it is taking words, like we saw, taking the word karma from the actual scripture. And so it is actually related to it. But as a book that you read by itself to enter into the scriptures, it doesn't work that way. So just to sum it up, it gives a framework for the perfection of wisdom so scriptures. And in specific um, response to your question, one has to be careful, obviously, reading something into a, another. In other words, it is a commentary coming later on the perfection of wisdom scripture. So one has to be careful that one's not reading something into it. But for myself, and certainly uh, I remember reading Edward Collins had it as his wallpaper. He, you know, he said, you can't come near these books unless you have it there because they're so incomprehensible. But for myself, uh, I'm just amazed at the author. And he, he, he's in a, a ground between being a bodhisattva and a Buddha. You never know what he is. And when you read the book, you, you really have to admire the author, whoever he was or she was. It's a just, and so, Yes, it has a great influence on me. Uh, it, because of how all Tibetan, you can't say all, but 
pretty, pretty much all Tibetan commentaries are based on it. But in terms of coming at the sutras or the scriptures themselves, one's always careful not to, how to say, read into the scriptures something out of a commentary when one's trying to have a certain balance. And it seems that even after uh, so many years, this text that I, I presume you too memorized in the monastic training context is so very much on your lips. You could uh, immediately uh, uh, produce the well, sections uh, of this text. But certainly, you know, you know uh, that is the central citation when you're going to explain compassion. Almost it's so many lectures across the entirety of the traditions, all the Tibetan. It becomes we all know that it, it, compassion, compassion, compassion. Oh, it's but where's it coming from in these incredible scriptures? Why are they so important? You know, what have they got to do with it? And so that is not easy to see. Did Jetson Jamgun Maitreya just Put it on there. Uh, I think when you read the hundred thousand, it, 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 it's it, there, there is no doubt about it. Now, whether that developed from an earlier sort of um, smaller version and, and that was brought out, but I don't think so. I think that basic um, that that's a, a basic thing in these scriptures, which we certainly get from the Tibetan tradition. So. A very short text like the Apisamaya uh, Lankara, clearly something that was and continues to be memorized. One uh, audience member has written in to ask that they have heard of stories of people memorizing the entire uh, perfection of wisdom in 100,000 lines. Is this something that you're familiar with? Are you, actually, uh, it, it's not, uh, I'm not familiar with that, but it isn't impossible because of the structure of it. So, you know, once you start off with the, the form saskanda, you, you know, with the, what's called the aggregate of physical forms, so the, the aggregate of feelings, the aggregate of perception, the aggregate of volitional factors, the aggregate of, of a consciousness, and then you go to the ayatans and so on. So each time you begin this, the beginning, you're going to know what's coming. It's not like you're memorizing each word. You, you have an understanding of what's coming continually. And oh, it has an incredible impact. Uh, I think there's been research into uh, the, what it, how to say, how it works meditationally. And that's been a major focus of, of more recent research. Um, certainly, it, if one spends a lot of time going through this text, it will have a tremendous effect on your mind. Uh, it certainly it has on mine. Uh, I, I'm really surprised at the amount of effect that it has on a human psyche or whatever you call it. Um, it, it really does. You, you cannot keep going over and over it like that without it um, affecting. Can you share a little bit more about some of the effects that you notice? it becomes very much a major thing in your mind. You know how we have many, many things, and it's not that everything goes away, not at all, but the foundational scriptures, which is to say the basic things which make a Buddhist practice, that's to say the, the noble eightfold path in essence, you know, which is the basic Buddhist meditation. And together with that, the so-called three gateways into liberation. Those just, uh, you, one is continually, continually recollecting all that one knows about those just by going over them again and again. And of course, it's always saying, Anupa Lamba Yogena. Don't make them into something which is in this world, which we always see another reason for violence or fighting. The, the fundamental thing 
if there was a Shakyamuni when he had his followers in the forest and they were going from one teacher to the others, please, whatever I say, you know, just withdraw into the forest, if you will, and just meditate, but don't. I, I don't think it's an, an anti-intellectual statement at all, but it's saying if that incredible blessing as a human being that you have of this amazing intellect, this ability to really plumb the depths of things, you know, if then you come at what is to all intents and purposes truth, you know, to all intents, uh, you know, the eightfold path to the extent that there's a praxis a, a, is the one which will get you out of suffering in the world that we live in. You know, you're not going to run away from it, as they say, it's not in the mountainside you can go, you can't go anywhere. Death's going to come after you, the whole problem's going to be here. But Whatever it is, even that, Anupa Lamba Yogena, even that one has nothing fundamentally that makes it authoritative. It's, it's without anything, just like the skandhas, the soul, the self, whatever, the scriptures too. And I really think that is something which hasn't been focused on enough. There's been a wonderful focus on the centrality of scripture, on how important it is in the Mahayana, but not in scripture as something which is empty of anything that makes it authoritative. And that, that's what comes into my mind continually as I'm reading, because it's just saying the most important things are to be taken without settling down on them without giving them any inherent existence and so without um apprehending them so i think that also explains how we get tantra coming in how you have this tremendous diversity of just tremendously rich scripture which can be taken as authentic scripture and this this sort of insight which is coming out of these scriptures it explains how they go together but anyway yeah thank you thank you so much for for sharing on that a number of questions have have come in i think really related to this key uh, word uh this phrase uh within uh, the scripture that you mentioned anupalamba yogena and uh i know that sort of within the current debates around, say, the um, the nature of the, the Heart Sutra, for instance, as a scripture, that there's been some interest in this very, um, if I recall, some variant of this same turn ap appears in that text as well, or the similar I idea of the, um, this somehow practice of not mm -hmm grasping if could you unpack this term a little bit for us a number of questions have come in asking like what what exactly does this mean to not settle on things mm -hmm. um uh when you're looking ontologically in other words when you're looking at things which are being taught not the actual teaching uh, what i've tried to switch the focus to is the actual, uh, how can we call it, the scripture, the epistemological aspect of it, which I don't think has been focused on enough. It's what the scripture is saying, the, uh, you know, the, the skandhas, the ayatanas, all of these things, the dharmas, they don't have any inherent existence or they uh, should not be apprehended. What I'm really trying to say is, yeah, but also, the teaching of them should not be apprehended because that's the thing that people fight about. <laughs> you know, it's either coming out of the words of a teacher's mouth or even more than that, in so many traditions, the book itself becomes so important. You go near that book. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're just talking about death and destruction, unbelievable death and destruction. And the material book is obviously important, but at the end of the day, it's important because of what it's saying. And it itself is not 
to be taken as inherently existent. So the reason I answer your question like that is because when you're talking from an epistemological point of view, not an ontological point of view, it's the authority. And that explains for me the whole development of the Pramana tradition, which comes after this. Because if you undercut the authority of the scripture, what's your Pramana? What's your authority? What's your um, valid means to be able to decide something is right or wrong? And therefore it goes to, uh, it goes in the direction it does. So in essence, then to answer your question, I would say a good way to take it for beginners like me at least, is to actually look at the scripture itself and somehow balance, which one has to be very careful to do, the incredible sacredness of that scripture, not because one says it's sacred, because it's been there for thousands of years. Balance that with looking at its having no claim to authority in and of itself. There is nothing in it which makes it finally authoritative. As I was saying, it has no history. There, there is nothing you're going to find in history or anything else which is going to show that it is the authentic one and that's the one you have. You, you you can battle over it. So uh, it slightly avoids your question, but that for me is um, the most important thing here. And so uh, I'm not sure I answered, but that's the best I can do. No, no, thank you so much. And I want to tie that back into perhaps from another angle from a, a, a member of the audience who's asked, you know, what specifically is the role of Nagarjuna in your point of view um, in terms of the spreading of this particular scripture. And, you know, given this, maybe that the scripture itself is always trying to undermine its own authority in an ultimate sense. Um, so, what uh, What's the, the role the, the, then of, of a great authority like Nagarjuna in terms of the, the scripture? Well, in Vigraha Vyavartani, you know, getting rid of the objections, the objection is, look, if you say everything has no inherent existence or no, you know, truth of its own, that statement of yours has no truth of its own. And so what you're saying, therefore, doesn't convey what it's trying to convey. It's an answer to that very um, objection. But historically, um, Clearly, the Mahayana Perfection of Wisdom Sutras or scriptures, um, certainly as you get into shorter and shorter versions, the huge amount of foundational scripture, all of the one after the other of the, uh, of the different categories which are coming down to the Abhidharma, they begin to kind of all get condensed, you know, from form up to the 18 attributes of a Buddha. That's all you'll get. And what you're getting is empty of an inherent existence. It should not be apprehended. And so Nagarjuna, I think it's um, uh, an eighth century uh, Dharma Mitra who first says, he explains, let's call it the obvious meaning of the sutra or the scriptures. The um, Munten in Tibetan, the um, the um, explicit. Nagarjuna is explaining the explicit, what it says explicitly, no inherent existence. What's hidden, this is Dharmamitra says, what's hidden is the entire path, the so-called Gyachempo, what you call the, 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 the vast, and the vast is everything taught in all the scriptures, whether this includes things outside Buddhist scriptures, uh, it is it may, but whether the actual scriptures themselves have that in mind or it's just to a Buddhist audience, that's unclear. So um, Nagarjuna, historically, I really 
I mean, he said to bring them back from the ocean, uh, but beyond that, I can't add anything. I, I just don't know, you know. That there's a lot of work, I think, being done on that, but I don't know. Thank you. We're, we're coming a little bit to the end of the time we have together for this event. So I'd like to ask you one last question, if, if I may. And uh, as I mentioned at the, at the beginning of this event, Kent State Foundation is really delighted to be able to support and really encourage 84,000 in the uh, translation of the perfection of wisdom and 100,000 lines uh, of which you're the, the lead translator for this project. Could you share with us a little bit about what the, the process of translation has been like, uh, you know, what does it just even on a practical uh, level, what does it mean to attempt a project of this scope and scale and how um, how do you approach uh, you know dealing with the text that say I think as you mentioned is over 10,000 pages yeah, in the it's country yeah. uh, it's a first of all I must say the um, the the support of the Kenzie Foundation of the 84,000 project is done in in a really uh, very very fine way uh, and in my experience it, it's always that case that the, the 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 support works out to really make for a better and better product or final product so in this case there really are um a, a number of layers of editing uh Initially, of course, there's a huge amount of work of deciding what you're translating. Now, luckily, we have in the 84,000 a clear understanding that we're translating the Delegate edition of it, at least as a, as a beginning, a start. Obviously, we're looking at many other works, too. And what's particularly um, wonderful for me, uh, the foundation supported in my earlier work a, a, a tremendous um, amount of work on the commentary, the so-called um, long commentary on the 18,000, the 25,000, and the 100,000, which is already published, uh, which you'll find online. Now, that one put together with these translations of these scriptures, the amount of work involved first in translation and don't forget we have other translations coming out in this 84,000 project and you have to be looking at them to see similarities dissimilarities are the words the same are they different how are you going to also think about that looking at it from a larger perspective and on top of that we have this whole new technological is that what we call it? This whole new technology. We're not writing it out in the way we used to. And it's being presented online. And so it really is a, um, for, from my perspective, I, I found it very heartening um, to see how uh, the foundation is giving us time to really make um, a product which will by no means be the uh, how to say, the end, uh, that everything can be improved, but not to rush it, to really try to get something which can authentically be called, you know, Buddha Vachana, the words of the Buddha. And so, um, yeah, and for myself, again, taking the words of the Abhisamalankara from the second chapter, you have three kinds of uh, moksha, uh, sorry, um, um, murpa in Tibetan. Sometimes you get uh, adimukti, I think is the Sanskrit. And it says for yourself, for others, and for both. And so if it's not for yourself, it's gonna be very hard to do it for others. In other words, if all I'm doing is something which I think is for others, but this doesn't really do something for me 
doesn't change me, make me a better person. And so one of the tremendous things in the way that the that this translation is has started is going along and I'm sure we'll come to its completion. It says it gives people like me, you know, Rangtun Lepa, a belief for myself. It increases my, um, the value personally to me is there. And I think through that, I'm sure with everyone else too, who's working on it, it's a greatly value to themselves, value hopefully to others as they read the work. And then the ultimate thing, value to both. So from a personal perspective, that's the best um, I can say about the, uh, about the work. Thank you so very much, Gareth. It was such a, such a pleasure to spend this time with you to, to hear your, your wonderful talk and especially to bring in some of the questions from the audience and, and just engage in conversation with you. So thank you again for sharing your, your you. time, your insight, your expertise, your wisdom with us. Thank you so much, all of you out there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. So as we bring this event to a close today, I just wanted to let you know about the next Goodman Lecture in this series. It will be delivered by uh, Kensei Foundation Fellow Eric Pema Kunsang, um, who's also an acclaimed translator of Tibetan texts. This, uh, this talk will be titled Key Points of Timeless Value. And it will take place um, in, uh, I think this is the Copenhagen time of Saturday, May 13th, that's at 4.30 p.m. in uh, uh, Central European Southern time, um, summertime, and then that's uh, 8.30 a.m. in San Francisco um, and 10.30 p.m. in East Asia. So there will be more information about that online. If you're on the Kensei Foundation mailing list, you'll receive information about this talk. And as always, you can visit um, uh, kenseifoundation.org slash events or kenseifoundation.org uh, slash the Goodman Lectures to, to learn more and stay in touch. So thank you all again very much for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. And may you all be safe and well.